And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday. Thank you, Greta. Well, here's our personal climate protest against what things that Greta talks about. Episode 86 of Climate Change Roundtable. I'm your host, Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow at the Heartland Institute. And today we have our regular panel, Dr. H. Sterling Burnett, Director of Heartland's Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. Linnea Lucan, Research Fellow at the Heartland Institute. And they're going to turn their attention, we're all going to turn our attention to the COP28 Climate Conference, which is set to commence in Dubai on November 30th. Now, to shed further light under the conference is Craig Rucker from CFAC. Welcome, Craig. Now, he's going to be attending COP28, and he's going to share his expectations of the conference, highlight some of the special interests uh, that play, maybe uh, reveal some of the little ploys that he's going to do with Mark Morano out there. Who knows? Uh, they always have some fun things we're doing at those conferences that these guys are or these guys are doing. Anyway, we'll take a critical look at all of this stuff and examine who's benefiting from this. And, you know, unless you're really one of the politically connected global elite, it doesn't look like you're going to get any benefit out of this conference at all. That and the crazy climate news of the week, which has become our regular feature, which we're going to get right into right now because we got so many of them to choose from. All right. Guess what? It's the Barbie locomotive. Yes, pink locomotives. But Wait, there's more. It's fully electric. That's right. A Barbie locomotive, fully electric, run by batteries to haul iron ore in Australia. Yeah, that's going to work. <laughs> I mean, anything but pink, really? Hey, the, the pink doesn't bother me. The, what bothers me is the idea that they're going to drag iron ore across the great desert in Australia and not expect that thing to power down in the middle of it. Um, I thought Barbie had a car. I think, wouldn't this be more Ken's thing? You know, Barbie and Ken, <laughs> maybe more the locomotive guy? Uh, maybe. I don't know if Ken is a trains guy. <laughs> but yeah, Ken is, seems, I, I haven't seen the movie, but from the commercials, it looks like all he is is a Barbie guy. <laughs> that he has no interest outside of Barbie. So. Um, if Barbie likes pink, maybe Ken would like pink trains. I don't know. All I know is this is doomed to fail. Uh, you know, you, you got this electric train hauling heavy machinery, heavy iron ore, not machinery, iron ore. It ain't light. Batteries fail under load. Ask the Ford Lightning manufacturers uh, how you know, those people who bought their Ford Lightnings and then can't haul anything from the back of their garage. Uh I, I I don't see a bright future for this. Well, it's not really hauling anything in this picture. Maybe it's just no. trying to haul itself and uh, <laughs> kind of go down the track looking pretty as Barbie waves to people. Well, you think about that. It's hauling itself. Diesel locomotives, diesel, by the way, they're diesel electric locomotives. They, they, they largely start with diesel, but then they run on electric batteries. But this is going to have a whole new kind of battery, right? It's lithium. So it's going to be heavier than your normal diesel locomotive. It's it's already adding weight. I wonder how it will do on the tracks. My suspicion is it will it'll destroy the tracks a lot faster because of the massive weight. You know, I would bet that compared to the amount of uh, fuel oil that that thing has to carry, oh. um, that the battery weight is probably at least ten times what the weight of the fuel oil would be. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna that that thing is going to destroy the rail system whatever whatever rail line it runs on it won't haul things very far but it makes for a nice photo op and nice virtue signal for the Australian government right so let's just call it the little engine that couldn't anyway um let's move on 
to the next thing. You know, James Hansen, the father of global warming back in June 1988, he was so sure of his prophecies and models that he had to uh, work with Timothy Worth, Senator Ooh. Timothy Worth, to open up the doors and the hearing room the night before and the windows to make sure that it was hot in there. They disabled the air conditioning so that when the cameras were on people, when he was testifying, people were sweating, right? You know, stagecraft. Well, he's published, he, he resigned, or rather retired from NASA. Uh, and now he's published another paper while he was in his retirement. And he's worried. Yes, he's worried because his new models say it's going to be even worse than we thought. It's hotting up even faster, accelerating global warming, all this usual rot that we've heard time and time again. And of course, he got front page coverage this morning on the New York Times. And the media is picking it up and eating it up without really critically examining this. But the bottom line is, is that this is just another model projection and an opinion from a guy that started the whole thing. I'm not worried about it. What do you guys think? It's it's kind of a thing, I think, in the environmental community to make bad predictions and get awards for it. I mean, this goes back to Paul Ehrlich, right? Mm -hmm. The guy said that uh, 65 million Americans would die of starvation by the mid-1980s. Uh, from my, uh, I, I was alive back then. I, I think 65 million Americans were dieting not starving back in the mid 1980s. Uh, you know, they, 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 they just continue to do these. I mean, look at Prince uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles, he got elevated too. He even predicted what, 52 months and the world would end back in 2008. So yeah. I think that actually Hansen is doing what gives those on the political left and in the climate alarm community, um, it's a source of advancement to make ridiculous predictions. Uh, yeah, the, that's true. The models are, are heating up. His model is heating up faster than the others. The only thing that's not heating up as fast as the models say they should is the actual temperatures. So, you know, uh, there's the, the, the old, are you going to believe what I'm telling you or are you going to believe what you actually see? And, you know, you're, you know, or you're lying eyes. In the end, neither, no uh, system for measuring temperatures, not the ground-based system, which is, woefully corrupted by urban heat island effect, not the weather balloon system, not the satellite system, show the earth heating up as fast, nearly as fast as current climate models. So a new climate model saying it's heating up even faster. Well, it's just more wrong. It just, it's just made an even worse prediction than the other models have already made. Yeah. Maybe we should just name him Dr. Doom. Speaking of doom, we have another doomer, Jonathan Overpeck. He's one of the one of the worst uh, people in terms of thinking dooms ahead. You should read his Twitter feed sometime. It's ugh. anyway. So he's got this graph up from the Washington Post showing academic papers that use the term climate emergency. Now, as I said time and time again, mm -hmm. climate emergency is a marketing tool, and it didn't really start becoming common until about 2016. This graph bears out what my observations are. And look at it. You think maybe if you put the word or the phrase climate emergency in the paper that you want to publish in a prestigious journal, it will get more attention and maybe get published? Gosh, seems to be. It's just a marketing term. That's well, all sadly, it it's it's dis particularly disgraceful because it's a normative term. It's it's implying something bad as opposed to science, which is say climate change. You can say climate change is happening. You can say climate, but if you say it's an emergency, you're no longer being a scientist. You're being uh, uh, an ethicist, uh, a politician. You're implying action. You know action is necessary. And my suspicion is many of them think they know what actions are necessary. That's not science. Yeah, nope. Copernicus ahead, didn't say, Copernicus didn't say, uh, well, it's an emergency that y'all don't understand uh, that the the earth, that, that the sun is the center of the universe. Go ahead, Linnea. You were going to say something. Um, right. And this actually relates to the, the past uh, topic about Hansen. Um, it's, it's not as if they're constructing this stuff because it's, it's where the science is leading them. They're constructing it for use in the media, right? Because a lot of climate scientists, and we've covered this on climate realism, a lot of them have started to move away from some of the more extreme model projections with warming. 
the higher level um, uh, pathways and and uh, boy, my brain's just not working. I cannot think of the right word. Uh, scenarios. They're moving away from some of those, not in the biological sciences. For some reason, they just love to tie RCP 8.5 into everything. But in the actual analysis of climate, they're starting to move away from the extreme scenarios. So for Hansen to come in and say, actually, it's worse than all of that, um, that's, a, that's a pretty bold move. And it's pretty clearly a media move rather than a scientific move. And, right. you know, and you know, they just needed to, they needed to stoke the fires again. That's really all it was about because we've got another cop coming up. Cop 28 is coming. We've got to save the world. This is the one we're going to save the world in, right? <laughs> Craig? I say, Lene, you, uh, you know, don't blame yourself for that lapse mentally in that. It could be, you could be suffering from climate change. I think there's a bunch of journals that came out and uh, indicated that uh, climate change is <laughs> it. And fear of climate change is a growing health threat, uh, and we need to take climate anxiety in particular more seriously. I think our own Mark Morano went on t television this week talking about that. So, you know, I just wanted so, to make sure. So it's not that you and I are getting old, Craig, when we can't remember something. It's climate change. I finally, I finally found a good reason to support the catastrophic theory of climate change. I'm, I'm going with that. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Climate anxiety. You know, I get climate anxiety every time I read the New York Times. Uh, all right. So here's the fun thing about climate emergency. In the dictionary, they don't have a solid definition for this. They say a situation in, in which urgent action is required to reduce or halt climate change and avoid potentially irreversible environmental damage resulting from it. Example, millions of people around the world took part in protest against an action on the climate emergency. They don't have a physical definition of it, like that. You know, the temperature has to get past this, or the sea level has to get past that, or the models have to say this. There's no definition. No, it's just Anthony, a marketing tool. They gave you a definition right there. No, million, it's not a definition. It's no, it is. The, the, the opinion, the, the the definition is millions of people gathered somewhere, so that's a climate emergency. If they're protesting uh, it, it must be an emergency. Yeah, I do well. think there's something more sinister at this. You saw this with uh, Biden after the Maui fires. You may remember uh, mm. climate emergency. He had the interview with the Weather Channel uh, gal there. And uh, essentially, uh, I think that they are moving us toward the idea of enacting something that would give the president climate emergency powers, uh, which would unleash a whole new uh, and, and getting the public comfortable with that terminology. Uh, is something that I think is in their agenda to a degree, and that would allow them to pursue a lot of these renewable energy things that they're trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, who knows, even this week, they're talking about meat uh, having health warnings, you know, because, uh, you know, just like you would cigarettes or something of that sort. So yeah. uh, saying that this meat will help raise the temperature of the earth. So I, I, I do think that they may be using this term. Obviously, it's leading up to COP28. We see at the every time there's a major UN summit, they start an exactly. emergency. But in addition, I think they're moving us toward climate lockdowns and some sort of climate emergency. And this is this their way of doing it. Well, back when I was working my dissertation, so Anthony is right. It, it's a marketing ploy. When I was working my dissertation, there was an environmentalist, I think it was Paul Shepard, who founded the She Shepherd Society. Before that, he had founded. Um, That's uh, Paul Watson, you mean? Uh, no, Paul. I don't think Paul Watson founded the Sea Shepherd Society, but maybe he did. But in any case, whoever it was, it, what he said is look, when we founded uh, Sierra Club, we were considered fringe. And so then we went out and founded the Natural Resources Defense Council and Environmental Defense, and it made Sierra Clubs seem uh, mainstream. And then we founded Earth First, and it made EDF and the Natural Resources Defense Council seem mainstream. And now we founded the Sea Shepherd Society, and it's going to make Earth First seem mainstream. So it's like always pushing the, the, the margin, always pushing the extreme to make the slightly less radical seem, well, that's reasonable. I like to think we have that relationship between CFACT and Heartland. We, we make you look less extreme by our <laughs> Or the other way around. I'm not sure which. It's not fair at all that you guys get such good uh, rankings from those uh, 
far left progressive media watch dogs and stuff. We're, uh, uh, you know, you I, guys I are always that. beating us on those. We are. We actually, I think, are five points lower than you. What's the name of that app that's now on? Uh, I forget what it's called. But anyway, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it is funny every time we get updated on it. Jim always keeps us updated and it's hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, so, we strive. Anyway. Back to the definition, you know, now Sterling says that that's a definition. I'm sorry. I just disagree with that. And here's why. Even the UN can't define it. If you look at their webpage about facts on climate emergency, you look at that list there, that series of bullet points, it's just a series of opinions. Really, there's no physical definition for once we pass this point, we're in a climate emergency, or once this happens, we're in a climate emergency. It's just a series of opinions. And, and most of it is completely factually wrong. And in fact, our own Jim Lakely here at the Heartland Institute went through this when I posted it up on our internal communication channel. And he says, this is simply remarkable. Nearly every sentence is wrong or a lie. The science of climate change is well established. No, it's not. It's largely misunderstood. And while climate change is real, human activity is not the main cause. If that's the case, prove it and have someone check your math. Tell us how much natural variation there is versus human caused variation. And then they go on to say greenhouse gases are directly linked to the average global temperature of the earth. Well, no. Greenhouse gases, yes, they're important. And yes, without greenhouse gases, we would be living on an ice ball, but they're not directly linked. We have seen this before that temperature and carbon dioxide have a lag lead relationship of about 400,000 years if you look at ice cores. So no, it's not directly immediately right now linked to the temperature. Um, and then they, they talk about it rising steadily and so forth and so on. The bottom line is, is that from my perspective, there is no physical definition of a climate emergency. There's a opinion about what a climate emergency is, but not a physical science definition. Well, and you know, I, Anthony, that's why you're gumming up everything with facts on this regard. This is meant to be emotional. I mean, you're driving down the oh, street I'm with sorry. your young child, and they say they have to stop at the next, next rest area. And you say, well, how bad is it? And they say, it's an emergency. You pull over because it's an emergency. you got to get the kid to the rest stop. So I think this is all psychological. That's what's called a pee bargain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I say that these are the types of things I think that are being used less because they have any scientific merit and more because of the fact that they uh, just are trying to prod action, uh, reckless action a lot of times uh, on the part of political leaders and others to uh, go the course that they want them to go. Yeah. All right. So let's go on to the next topic. Meat. It's what's for sinners. They are being after meat for for years. You know, we can't eat meat because it's nasty. It makes carbon dioxide. It makes methane, blah, blah, blah. Now they want to put cigarette style warning labels on meat packages because it's just as bad as cigarettes, apparently. Gosh, can you no, it's, imagine it's, it's, the public it, outrage to this if this happens? Presumably for the climate, it's worse than cigarettes. Uh, right. <laughs> um, you know, not for us, but for cl for the climate. Uh, you, look, as far as I'm concerned, they can put if if they want to clutter up their things with labels, let them do it. It, it. it it makes no difference to me and to anyone who likes meat. My suspicion is they won't say, "Oh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna no burgers this Fourth of July on the grill," because of course on the grill, right? You're already emitting carbon if you've got your charcoal grill or your natural gas. You're already uh, burning fossil fuels. Uh, it, it, yeah. It, well, it, it, no, no, the problem is if they get the, if, if they if they get this warning on there, the real danger is once the warning. And he's there been we go. he's, he's been taken in. out. He's been taken out. He's frozen. That's an interesting expression you have on your face there, Sterling. Yeah. I was going to say, is, are we getting to the point now where just like uh, cigarette smoking was made kind of taboo that you got to go out back and smoke a cigarette? Or in my day, it used to be you had to do it in the restroom in between classes. Are we going to do that with burgers now? In order to eat meat at school, you're going to have to sneak into the restroom when the teachers aren't looking and eat meat. <laughs> I think, I think well, I'm just 
like waiting. You know, when I buy a flight uh, at Drop United, it in the boys' room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I I already get a little like they'll tally up when you get a flight with United now, like what your carbon footprint is. They print it on the receipt, and I just know that in the next couple of years we're going to start having that at the grocery store if this stuff isn't turned around. You know, you're going to yeah. get they're going to tally it without putting it towards anything and then they'll start the carbon credit the personal carbon credit system uh if this doesn't get stopped quick enough Which that's what i think it'll, it'll also that's be where a legal it's going ploy. it'll also be a legal ploy because people groups environmental groups will use this as evidence to go into court and say look the surgeon general has said meat is bad for you uh the 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 government has calculated how much your carbon footprint is and it's dangerous so we should be able to sue you or any group, you know, pick pick your your subpopulation. We should be able to sue you, meat eaters, right? There's a class they want to go after, meat eaters. Uh, let's take them to court. Uh, we've got their, you know, we, we've calculated their carbon footprint. We know who's eating meat because we now have it on there that they purchased meat. Bring them to court and uh, make them pay up. Yeah, I'm looking for some USDA prime Angus crickets. All right, yeah. wind power collapse. In the middle of all of this stuff, wind power is not being, well, it's just not getting there. In fact, one big company pulled out Orsted. They said, yeah, we're done. Economics just didn't work. And this is putting a big dent in the whole Biden administration's climate goals because, you know, it was predicated on more wind power and more solar power. Uh, but, you know, if the companies start pulling out because it's not economically feasible, it seems to me like the politics are infeasible, too. But that's not going to stop them. And you raise a great point here. I mean, on uh, <laughs> we've actually calculated because I know that uh, we work closely with Heartland on this issue with the uh, trying to save the right whale off the uh, coast of eastern coast of the United States where they're trying to put in all these uh, wind turbines uh, that there's probably I mean, Biden had a goal of getting about 30,000 megawatts of offshore wind. Uh, according to the Washington Post, I think it just came out yesterday, about 18,000 of that 30,000 is now in jeopardy of just totally collapsing. And it gets better news than that. The remaining 12,000 doesn't even have contractors because they're looking at these particular collapses and you know they're hesitant to get into the game. Now comes banking reform. You got, uh, because of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, you know, they're revamping how banks can give loans for projects. And of course, up to this point, renewable energy companies maybe didn't have the capital, but they could sell the tax credits and things that they got to the banks, kind of tax equity uh, to be able to make a get more capital for their projects. Well, that's transitioning now. And it looks like uh, there's going to be more of a squeeze on these energy companies based on the reforms that are coming forward. So they're they're just kind of out of luck in a whole host of areas in terms of getting finances. And the public backlash to this is mounting like never before. You've seen Democrats, Republicans coming out against it. The PSC, I mean, these are states where they're getting shot down that are not exactly ones where you see MAGA supporters. You're looking at Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York. Uh, these are all states that these are collapsing in. And, uh, you know, and it's based on uh, just grassroots opposition, 50 mayor uh, mayors in New Jersey town signing the petition to stop all offshore wind. So I think, uh, you know, this is all good news. We should pop quarts of champagne and be celebrating the demise of the Green New Deal here. Well, and and that's, course, that stuff. Sorry, Sterling. But that yeah. stuff is um, very great for them. But it's also something that the other side is starting to anticipate. They're putting a new um, bill forward in Michigan where they're saying that now they're going to take the power away from local communities to say no to projects like this. They're taking away their veto power if this bill passes. So they're trying to get around this. Hopefully, you know, I don't have a I actually don't have a whole lot of positivity on this one for Michigan because I think both their House and Senate are captured. So what you're saying is it's like eminent domain. They're going after yeah. wind and solar is now like highways. And we need to emphasize eminent domain on it. Oh, that was that was always going to be part of this. Yeah, I eminent mean, domain is a different thing. That's the private land. The this is is cities have traditionally been able to zone and say we don't want certain industries in certain places. This is saying you can't do that anymore. Yeah. 
at or least with, with regard right. at least with regard to wind and solar and uh, looking the the offshore wind is one the electric vehicle is the other one where it's collapsing as we talked about last week with the carbon king jason isaac um you have or no i'm sorry yesterday on uh, on uh, in the tank i hope everyone saw it um but the thing is what many people are predicting you know i've already seen the headlines there soon all these companies say biden wants this the government wants this they want it. They need to pony up the money to pay for it. And so they'll just go to the federal government and say, we need even more handouts than we're already getting to get this done because you want it. And my, you know, if it's the Biden administration, um, they'll just tap into their nearly unlimited inflation reduction act, ha uh ha, -huh, uh, funding and start doling out the dough. Oh yeah. You need, you need an extra 20 billion to get this done. Here it is cut you a check but by the way i do want to give you some hope i know you're you say you're from michigan i didn't realize that but you know your detroit lions they were pretty pathetic a couple of years ago and nobody really <laughs> they're now so good i think you have reason to be hopeful because in new jersey the democrats did the same thing they tried to strip the local communities of their traditional home rule and that's where orsted just collapsed uh despite that uh, effort by the uh you know by right. Phil Murphy and the Democrats to strip them of home rule, it still got tremendous pushback and they're not making headway there. So, you know, cheer up. I said, just like I said, your Detroit Lions are doing better. I think they'll start, you know, if you work at organized grassroots there, I think there's still some hope in Michigan. No, I, I don't I don't mean to um, cause any confusion there. I do not live in Michigan and I'm not from Michigan. I've just been covering it recently for oh, environment okay. and climate news. But and, yeah. Well, for those who are listening from Michigan, Yes. It sure look like a youper to me, though. Well, you know, and New yeah, York did a few. New York did a few years ago. New York uh, subverted their local opposition a few years ago. They did it on fracking. They said, "Well, if you support fracking, too bad. We're going to take that away from you." And then they went into wind and solar, and they said, "Now we're going to take away your right to block wind and solar." So it, it, they took it away both ways. Although there's good news on that too. Just within the last couple of weeks, uh, they are trying to get the South Fork wind project in uh off long island to get the cables from that offshore wind site onto long island to be able to service everyone the local community said no and hocho i guess that governor of uh of uh, new york did, did not overturn the local rule so at the moment they're building the wow. wind rights, but they have no means to get the power on shore which to me is excellent so we'll see if uh how that goes right. in the future all right so let's move on we'll get into cop 28 so here's one of the stories about COP28. They're worried because it's uh, in Dubai. The clash over fossil fuels pits the United Arab Emirates against public health experts. Uh, yeah, basically, they get a seat at the table this time, the, 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 uh, the folks that are producing oil in the Mideast. And so that's got a lot of people really worried that, you know, maybe this one will fail too. I mean, whatever. Um, right. There's, it, it, it's just absurd. You know, uh, they they want to get rid of fossil fuels. We demand zero, net zero, all of this. But at the same time, without fossil fuels, this conference couldn't even happen. People couldn't even get into their private planes and get there. It's absurd, the hypocrisy. Right. And, and you know, the I guess the sultan of the UAE is, you know, because they have a nationalized oil industry, I believe. And correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think Sterling would probably know. Uh, but I think won. I am right. Yeah. Um, he's he's also the CEO of their national oil company. <laughs> right. So they're kind of ticked off um, <laughs> about the uh, conflict of interest there. Let's say they're worried that there won't be a consensus at this conference to end fossil fuels because their hosts are, you know, one of the uh, one of the major fossil Even, fuel industry regions in the world. Well, the whole country is developed on it, right? I mean, you yeah. don't have golf courses and uh, islands in the middle of oceans built up. I mean, the middle of seas built up and high rises without the fossil fuels that they use. Yeah, I mean, they no one work. no one would be holding a conference there. They're not holding a conference in Mogadishu. They're holding it in the UAE because it's pretty fancy. It's pretty nice. Sweet hotels. That's all fossil fuels, folks. 
I think we should send them to uh, North Sentinel Island. That's where uh, the well, I think we should, should drop them with parachutes into North Korea and let them hold their conferences there. But no, I got I got to go to this conference. I'm I'm okay with it. Where it's at. <laughs> yeah, I, work I mean, this guy, what's his name? Al Jabber or something like that heads the Abu Dhabi oil company. I think over ninety percent of the uh, uh, country runs on fossil fuels. Uh, mm. So it's uh, and they don't just use like coal or anything. They burn oil. They burn uh, oil. Yeah. Use it. But he apparently is also in charge of their renewable program. But it hasn't stopped the Greens from protesting it pretty vociferously. I think there was a letter sent by Greenpeace and 450 other organizations over the summer objecting to this guy, saying this is like putting a fox in charge of the hen house or putting somebody from the cigarette industry in charge of, you know, cancer research. So <laughs> if you if you want to think about egregious you know, the, the level of sort of egregiousness. Think about this. The UAE and all of the uh, the oil sheikdoms and the other countries that benefit uh, from oil, they are also in the group of countries who are likely to receive funding from the, uh, you know, to the extent that, that it's funded, the uh, <laughs> Green the, Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund, but also yeah. this time what they're really pushing for is the Loss and Damages Fund which will like be multiple times the green climate fund and they'll be the reset. They'll be one of the recipients of it. So they can't lose. They, they, they are really, really deft planning to them. Yeah. So it's all about the money. And speaking of money, get this amnesty.org has gotten into, gotten out of the, uh, we're saving the hostages business. And now they're talking about human rights focused loss and damage fund for climate change to alleviate suffering. Ah. Uh, Gosh, you know, it's just failure of your mission, folks. They're just into the wrong business now. Yeah, I saw something on this recently that uh, they're going to try to go for 300 and some billion to help nations with adaptation. And uh, and it's uh, they, they actually in the last COP uh, put together a kind of way to move forward on loss and damage, which was something we thought was you know, fanciful back when it first came up in the early, I'm going to say it was in Cancun COP back in 2012, thereabouts. Uh, everybody laughed at it, but it goes to show you how an idea, no matter how insane, if said often enough, can actually be adopted. And uh, now it's actually, I said, it's been adopted by the COP in COP 27 last year in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. And now they're trying to raise money for it. So, uh, and I, I'm convinced they'll be every bit as successful in that as they were with the Green Climate Fund. Look, 2015, we were supposed to establish something called the Green Climate Fund that would have $100 billion a year uh, delivered to it and then given out to various countries. It has never reached that. It's It's eight years later, we still don't have a green climate fund for $10 billion a year, much less a hundred billion dollars a year. And now they're going to say we need four or five times that I, I heard the figures were higher, closer to a trillion dollars a year, not 300 billion. And look, if they can't even get the 10 billion or the hundred billion for the green climate fund, what are the chances they'll actually fund? You can ask for whatever you want. I, you know, you go out and, and, and negotiate, for a multi-million dollar contract as a as a uh, director of the Arthur B. Robinson Center, I ain't going to get it. So they they can do all they can ask for all they want. Ask for the moon. It That's ain't going to happen. It hasn't happened already. They're not getting what they've already been promised. The promises are empty. Yeah, just think if we got even a million dollars out of that hundred million sterling, we wouldn't have to operate out of our basement to do the show. <laughs> Anyway, it's all about follow the money. Yep, it's all about following the money. And and all the different cops have all been the same. Here's a cartoon from our resident cartoonist, Josh. Yep, this is what it's all about. And it's the same thing every time. And now we're on 28, except we've got this cool oil and gas guy sitting in the middle. He doesn't need any money while everybody else is out there looking for it. That's really what it's all about. Follow the money. So one Craig couple... Sorry, good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask. You know, we've got Craig on here, and he has uh, a wealth of experience already at these cops. I wish he would describe a few of the cops he's been to before. Uh, you know, his opinions on how they work and uh, what he's seen, and maybe some adventures. 
as a, as a run-up to talking about what he expects for this cop? Yes, a wealth of experience. I guess uh, I'm not a rookie at this anymore, though. I'd like to think otherwise. I've been going to these things since, the, uh, I'm gonna, when was the first one? I think it's like 1997. And uh, this will mark my over 25th one of these conferences that I've been to. Um, you know, there's been a remarkable transition. I think the original cops going back a long time ago really focused a lot more on the science. And that was kind of settled that they wouldn't discuss science anymore in the early 2000s uh, under Bush. And it's all been about implementation, you know, whether it was first Kyoto, then they were talking about a second Kyoto, which never happened. And now it's the Paris Accords. And um, I, I would say the consistency is, as Anthony has said, uh, there's always been a focus on money. Uh, and I'd say that's one of the principal drivers. I would say also ideology. I mean, I look at a number of the people there that uh, all attend these. They're not people that you would see at a normal NRA convention or anything like that. They <laughs> are mostly people that are uh, academics. A lot of them, they remind, I, I used to joke, they seem like they were people that I knew in my liberal college I went to, these professors that opined about great things. They had no authority to do anything, but now they found a job at the UN and they can make their kind of ridiculous fantasies come true. And uh, so you see just a lot of intellects. And uh, one of the one of the other things you'll find at this, there's a dichotomy. They have what they call the blue zone and a green zone in these meetings. Uh, we are actually blue zone accredited. That means we can go in where the national actors are. And you'll see a more serious debate there, uh, not about climate science or anything like that. It's mostly a positioning for money and things of that sort. But at least the people are kind of adult, if you would. Uh, that you can talk to them about rational things of uh, economics, science, you know, it's just a more uh, stately conversation. But if you go to the green zone, that's where the crazies are. And uh, they, there you will see all sorts of very interesting things from, you know, ecofeminism to, uh, you know, Gaia worship and, uh, you know, trying to change the Ten Commandments to be earth centered. Uh, so if, you know, you get bored with the uh, state ones that are very dry and talking very technical, you can always wander into the green zone and kind of, you know, get alive again. So uh, a lot of the attention that the media focuses is mostly on the blue zone. Uh, I've been kicked out of it a couple times, as is Mark Morano, my cohort, uh, but we've always been able to do penance and swear fidelity to the UN and get back in. So uh, <laughs> swear fidelity to the UN. Well, if you have your fingers crossed, put your yeah. put put your blue put your blue helmet on. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we got two more things to cover here. We got India. They're gonna, according to the early reports, India says, "Nah, we're not gonna get involved. We're not gonna get into that global cooling nonsense because, guess what? We've got a country to build." Go figure. You know. They don't want to reduce what they're doing because they're starting to see prosperity in India. You know, they're raising people up out of poverty, just like China has done. And uh, guess what? Without fossil fuels, you can't do that. And that's been why the world has been so successful to date. I mean, you look at what the world was 100 years ago and how many people were living in poverty and, and what little we had. Fossil fuels have, have enabled prosperity prosperity globally and yet they want to kill that and it's all about we want the money we don't want you to have it which is what these cop things are about and well, finally and, and, go ahead sorry and regarding this story anthony i mean this is so much worse than that too because they've been saying for years that heat related illness is going to be on the rise because of climate change and now they're asking india which most of the continent is in you know uh, near equatorial temperatures they want them to stop using air conditioning in the few places that they do have air conditioning? Are they out of their minds? <laughs> well, I mean, and, are they just trying to boost the heat related illness? Well, and, and as you wrote, as you wrote earlier this week, uh, Linnea, look, another reason for India not to embrace global cooling is the fact that even in India, uh, it kills what eight times, uh, six times more people, cold temperatures than hot temperatures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> They don't want global cooling. Nobody, nobody I know really wants global cooling. No one says, oh my gosh, I wish the glaciers would just form outside my front door. <laughs> I'd have a nice, I'd, I'd have a nice ski slope. I mean, in my case, I've already got my Buffalo robe, right? I could put it on. I did in the house when our power went out in Texas. 
Uh, but most people aren't as well uh, situated as I am. They, 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 uh, they don't know how to produce their own meat from animals that are now uh, can't find meat, can't find uh, uh, plants to eat because it's covered under snow. Nobody uh, wants global cooling. Well, on that issue, well, you will cool have to, at the COP28, as you do a lot of them, uh, it's odd to me that the Greens really, they always, when they give out this award all the time, it's called the uh, Fossil of the Day Award. And, it, and the media follows them around. They usually give it to Canada, the U.S., Europe. They rarely give it to China or India. And when I asked the Greens about that at the conference, they go, well, okay, you got the world largest emitters of CO2, which is certainly in China. I said, why are they not getting it? And they'll make comments to me like, because they're producing, you know, all this renewable energy. Now, yes, they do have some big projects, but at, at a general level, what they're really doing is producing it for those of us in the West because we have mandates in renewable energy. And so they're selling it to us. Said, you know, if we had mandates to have plastic swing sets in our front lawn, I'm sure that they would be the world's biggest producer of plastic swing sets so that we could put them in our lawn. But that doesn't mean that they themselves use them. Uh, they're putting up a new coal plant pretty much every week. And well, it and, and and they're and they're producing it using coal, right? They're exactly. building all that stuff using coal. And they are slave labor. <laughs> yeah, and slave labor. And they are look, they are putting up wind turbines and, and solar panels. And, and, and they're not cooked hooked up to anything, but they can take nice nice pictures and, and say, Oh, look at look at that vast uh plane that we covered with solar panels that aren't really contributing much to our grid, but that's okay. We've got a nice picture and they, and they've got people like Gavin Newsom come over and say, gosh, we could learn a lot from China. Now in this instance, I'm going to agree with him. We could learn a lot from China. Let's build coal. Let's continue oh, using yeah. coal. Uh, Newsom finally got something right. We could learn a lot from China. China loves Newsom in California. They wish the entire United States would adopt his plans because it would sink us relative to them. All right. China's giving lip service to the whole thing. India's saying, nah, Russia's like, nah, we're in producing mode. You know, and so the Western countries are the ones that are suffering the most from all this. So in the whole thing, the scheme of things, finally, we have this. Pope Francis is going to go to the big climate whatnot. Yes, he's going to head there. Maybe he'll give a blessing. Maybe he'll announce that they're going to have climate exorcisms for the carbon possessed. Who knows? But it's sure going to be interesting to see what he has to say. Well, maybe he'll meet with his friends in China, who's who he's already agreed that they can appoint the Catholic uh, bishops and in, in uh, there, you know, because the Chinese are so tolerant of the Christian religion. Well, I think that this is important that he does this because uh, the conference was going astray last time. It was in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, and it, that happens to be not far from Mount Sinai. And the Green staged a very big. Uh, thing over there uh, with a bunch of the world's religions trying to mimic the Ten Commandments, but coming down off my, Mount Sinai, not like Moses did with the Ten Commandments people are familiar with, but with a new green Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe this prompted him because, you know, it gave him some alarm that maybe the old Ten Commandments will be, you know, replaced based on the last cop. And he feels the need to come to this cop to right. hopefully set that straight. Oh, no, he's going to be, he's, he's going to, received some pushback too, I'm sure, from the environmental left because um, he's taken some very strong positions against their population control uh, agenda. You know, he says that there's there's no grounds on which population control is appropriate, not even for environmental problems and especially not for environmental problems. Um, you know, he said that you cannot treat mankind like we're fundamentally harmful to the environment. We're not like a parasite or a virus the way that a lot of these uh, greens talk about it. So um, it'll be, you know, regardless of his position on it, which he seems to be uh, quite convinced by the climate catastrophe stuff. Um, I think he's going to find it very uncomfortable, actually. Yeah, he's not going to be real popular there. Anyway. Um... <laughs> All right. So, so, Craig, so what are you going to do? Go to this, hmm? well, well, let's get, let's find out what Craig's going to do at COP. You know, what, what he well, anticipates. I, that's what I was just getting to. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask you, Craig, you're headed to this thing. You've been to these before. What are your expectations? What do you think is going to happen? And, and what are you going to do? Unless you've got some surprises in the store. No need to tell us. I can't tell you entirely yet because we got to find out what the, uh, what the ability is to be able to, uh, 
uh, do any sort of protesting. They've been very, um, it's, it's a, we've done a lot of things, as you uh, know, we've uh, parachuted into conferences in the past. We've uh, boarded Greenpeace ships and dropped banners off them. We've tore up the Paris Accord in uh, Morocco, uh, shredded it with a big statue of Trump next to it to showcase that and got kicked out. Um, and we've been able to do some stunts like that. It, we're a little more nervous about doing that in, uh, you know, Arab countries, <laughs> frankly, ones that uh, tend to not to put up with that nonsense. Yeah, Unless it's an anti-Israel protest, they don't allow for protests too much. Uh, so we actually will be uh, going there and we'll have some antics set up, but we got to, uh, and we're trying to clear it right now. But I would say that the big thing is the uh, part of the Paris Accord is that they have to, every five years, they have a term for it, do a review of how nations are doing with their national implementation plans and adaptation and adoption and financing. And that'll be the big topic there. They're going to be reviewing these, uh, uh, how nations have been do coming up to date and, and trying to work together to keep the world's temperature at 1.5 degrees over the next, uh, until the end of the century. And how close they're getting to net zero uh, they've kind of put out a loose goal by 2050. Uh, they're applauding Germany, I think, which just moved it back to 2045. So there'll be a lot of these national implementation plans going to net zero, trying to keep the temperature as though they actually control the temperature, the UN does in these nation states. Uh, I think Morocco put it best. He said, I think it's easier for people to uh, change their gender than it is for their to change their national economy from uh, fossil fuels to electric and try to do that. Uh, so that'll be what's on the plate principally. And of course, loss and damage. That's another big one, which is basically when hurricanes hit the Philippines or some of these developing countries, how much of the increased damage is caused by you, uh, the people listening to this broadcast, driving their SUVs or, you know, now eating meat and things of that sort that maybe turn that hurricane from a category two to a category three and how much more damage that caused. And we should be on the hook for helping that country rebound from that hurricane. That would be an example of the types of things that they think uh, uh, need to be discussed and uh, we, they got, they're going to be weighing. Mm. Yeah, and then we've got the island countries in the Pacific, like Tuvalu, which are always there, you know, banging the drum for more money because our islands are sinking. In the meantime, they're taking the money that they do get and they're building new resorts and new airports, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. But actually, I think I, somebody said their island actually has increased. I, I One of our yeah, yeah. it has to do with plate tect tectonics. It's not that uh, exactly. the levels haven't risen. It's that the... <laughs> so, I, I but, agree. And it also... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, atolls. Also... When they float, they grow. Uh, that, that's just the nature of the way they, these things are. And, you know, the, that study, that scientific study, showed that those island nations actually grew in the period of time where the left is saying, oh, they're sinking under the seas due to sea level rise. And, this, and the president of Tuvalu a few years ago staged a stunt underwater, you know, where people were writing on grease board, grease, with grease pens on, on things that they used to communicate into water, uh, you know, signing a pact to say, you know, we need to do this to keep us from sinking further into the ocean and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, organizations just threw money at them. And they're not paying attention to what's really happening. They're just thinking with emotions uh, when it comes to this stuff. And that's why you see these organizations and these countries that are saying, we need reparations. We need climate justice. Really, it's all about the money. That's it. And speaking of the money, if you look at some of the money that, that has been already delivered, because there has been resources delivered to the Green Climate Fund, a lot of it's been expended. Not all of it's been accounted for. In fact, they've got a really poor accounting process. But just last year, they came out with uh, among the few things they could track. Well, some of the money was spent uh, on building gelato franchises in uh, various countries uh, and, Ital you know, the Italian money. Some of the money was built making a Sterling, romantic. Sterling, that's a worthwhile endeavor. <laughs> that's a worthwhile. Yeah. Well, and they and they and they did a film in Argentina. Uh, not about climate change, mind you, but about a love. Uh, it was a love story. Uh, the point is, but that counted. That counted as a carbon. Uh, you know, the, the countries involved were getting carbon credit for this, right? Oh, we 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 provided our funding for a film and for gelato and for you know various other things that were like 
this has not only does it have nothing to do with climate, it could in fact be contributing to climate change if, if you were right, because uh, in the middle of Argentina, they weren't getting out there in electric cars to the to this, you know, to to where it was filmed. Uh, gelato takes refrigeration. Uh, last I heard, they don't like refrigeration. I'll be curious. One of our the things that we do quite often is to go and see just uh, how elaborate these uh, functions are yeah. at these uh, particular events. And uh, they can be quite posh in many occasions with, uh, you know, just the way they roll it out. And typically countries like the UAE, they hold nothing back. So I'll be very curious as to, uh, you know, the private jets that come in, the big diners and dinners and stuff. And that may be something that we have to cover. I think last year we glued ourselves to some artwork, uh, Egyptian artwork when it was out there, but fake glued ourselves and got carried out by a security that uh, was a cute video. So we may have something like that in store for this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, if, you hey, could account, if you could account for the private jets and tell us, report on how many meals they serve that where the main course is insects. That's what I want to know. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I, I'm sure that nothing bad will happen to you guys. If you splash a bunch of orange paint all over uh, their priceless works of art and stuff, I'm sure that'll go over just fine. This will be my last appearance on your show. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a more subtle suggestion for meal planning uh, there, Craig, you know, we've had all these whales die over on the East coast that are, being linked to wind farms, subsonics, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you could get a hold of some whale blubber from those whales, I would go to the whale or to the wind symposium and offer that up as appetizers for people there. There you go. Ooh, well, that actually that that, that if not there, that is definitely worthy of something uh, at some point. I like that idea a lot, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so. Get get some, get the next conference in the Faroe Islands. There, you might get some whale blubber or Japan. Yeah, you do have to be careful at the UAE. Now, the UAE has told uh, all the NGOs, because I think Britain uh, put in a uh, complaint saying that they, because uh, they were initially not going to allow for protests, uh, that they wanted the uh, climate alarmists to be able to have their protests. Those are always good opportunities, too, to interview people, because they kind of show their real colors at a protest. They cut loose, and uh, <laughs> some of those characters are rather amusing just to uh, interview them and to uh, hear what they have to say. Well, you know, they may have to allow it, but I bet Britain didn't get them to specify where they would allow it. Yes, it's a big <laughs> desert behind you. I was about to say, <laughs> you can have all the protests you want in the middle of that desert out there. I do plan to get some skiing in. Uh, I've done that before where you can go snow skiing in their mall. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, sure, I, I'm not sure that that's something that uh, doesn't require a bit of fossil fuels to maintain the cold. Yeah, I'm sure that's not a carbon intensive activity. No. Yeah. So, Craig, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen at the end of this? Is it going to be just like all the other com conferences where they will have a last minute, you know, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't get there, you know, it's terrible, we're not making an agreement, and then they'll have a last minute breakthrough, and then they'll make some formal announcement, and the world is saved yet again? Or do you think they're just going to, you know, what do you think is going to happen at the end of this? You know, they're so staged uh, that that is pretty much the template. I mean, you can tell almost every four years that right before, and we saw it this year, you saw it with Idalia, the hurricane, you saw it with the Maui wildfires, they kind of, and uh, uh, the release of a report, I think, out of Africa right before this, they, uh, they always hype the alarmism, come up with some new studies that say that, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning of this broadcast, that say we're in an emergency. Then during the conference, uh, they have some big speakers. In this case, they'll kick it off with uh, King Charles and follow it up with the Pope. And then they'll be saying that there's no progress being made and everything is awful. And then somebody like either Greta Thunberg, Al Gore, I don't know who this cause celeb is this year, will come through and the nations will see the error of their ways and they'll come out with some declaration. It'll be the uh, Dubai, Dubai something or other, you know, uh, agreement. And uh, the dubious well, Dubai agreement. Yes, <laughs> but they do. They get <laughs> catchy names for every one of them and uh, then plan to meet next year where they can take their private jets, do the caviar and everything else and go back over it. So it's uh, it's become a tradition. I do actually appreciate. I mean, I, I've gone to these things, as I said, for 30 years. We've never had them in Toledo or uh, Columbus or, uh, you know, some uh, 
poor part of the world. It's always a Bali, Indonesia or a Marrakesh or some sort of uh, nice spot around the world. So uh, are you so telling me that Gary, Indiana isn't on the docket? No, no. Gary has not been mentioned or, or if it has, it's been rejected. Yeah. Yes. Buenos Aires, yeah. you know, they go to these types of places. And I will say it was a little bit of a depression, depressing thing to hear it was in Dubai again. I would have preferred it to be someplace a little bit different. And that, given the what's going on in the Middle East, there has been some thought. Now, a few years ago, they uh, were going to hold it in Santiago, but the protesters there were all upset uh, based on a lot of the uh, energy restriction, transportation, subway, all that type of stuff, which were climate policies. And they moved it to Madrid. And uh, one thing we noted there, we had talked about meat at the offset, is that the uh, main place people ate uh, was a Burger King. Oh, I remember and, that. Uh, that Burger King interestingly when we went up to it and we told the people about the what was it the impossible burger or whatever they served there they were clueless they said now you have to go to Madrid for this this is real beef and uh so all the delegates and we had fun with that we got a guy in a cow suit walking through asking them how they liked their burgers because it was just packed it was the most eaten at place and vendor in the entire place was a burger king serving real meat not impossible burgers yeah, I was at that conference and I went there to that Burger King and I can attest that place was packed. There was lines backed up. People were lining up for that that stuff. Anyway, so we've gone through quite a bit talking about COP28. Now it's time to field some questions from our viewers and see what we have. I'm sure there's a, a few interesting questions that we have that uh, we can answer today. So our producer Andy brings up this one. Montana Galt asks, how are the cops powered? Wind and solar? Well, Craig, you've seen some examples. I've seen some examples too. Let's talk about that. Well, I, I do. They will if there is a portion of the cop. Generally, it's not the entire cop that is solar. They'll make big fanfare of that, and uh, that'll be something that they try to show the delegates. And there have been ones that they've done that in the past. So I don't know how they're doing it in Dubai, but if it's consistent with how they've done it in the past, there will be a portion of it, probably in the green zone where the crazies are, that uh, is powered <laughs> by that. Uh, we have in the past seen in Mexico, and I remember this very prominently, they had a big wind turbine outside of it, and uh, they were showcasing that part of it was done by uh, renewable energy. But we went and looked into that and found that actually that wind turbine was powered by the electric grid, which was not running on renewable energy at all. But it made for a good prop to have a big turbine going around in a circle saying that it was powered by renewable energy. That was just to keep people cool, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. what it, it, looked, it looked kind of amusing, but we actually suspected that why would that one turbine be generating that much electricity? And turns out it wasn't. So yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of fanfare on that one, especially given the guy, what's his name, Al Jabber. He's in charge of the uh, renewable energy infrastructure for the UAE. And so I'm sure he'll want to showcase something just as they did in Charm El Sheikh last year, the biggest exhibit was by Saudi Arabia of all countries, which gets, again, over 90% of electricity from fossil fuels. But they had this gigantic thing showing off some of their renewable projects that probably contribute about 0.1% of the energy in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, just to showcase to everybody how they're now getting interested in it. All right, let's look at our next question. <laughs> how dare you? Yeah, how dare you go to this, Craig? Yeah, well, as I said, it's uh, somebody has to save the earth, you know, from the greens. And uh, if you're going to go to uh, Dubai or Marrakesh or Paris or, you know, Copenhagen, I mean, it's our fate to have to do that. So we'll, All right. we'll suck it up and go. All right. Well, thank you for daring. Wheelman asks, Gary, an even better question is how many whales are killed by offshore wind? Sterling, you've been following this story quite a bit, and you too, Linnea. I have not, but I, I think it's up in the hundreds now, is it not? Right. We the, the answer is we don't know. That's the appropriate answer. What we know is dozens, uh, I think more than 60. It's now washed more than up, 70. I'm sorry? More than 70 more on the coast. Have washed up on shore, but you only know about the ones that, that actually wash up on shore, right? Um, what we do know is this. The North Atlantic right whale is endangered. It's been listed as endangered since the Endangered Species Act was first written, which means it's supposed to be protected. The government's own studies show that not a single, zero 
0.07 whales can be by law taken each year in addition to natural mortality by humans. Uh, the wind turbines that they're building out there have gotten permits to take 17 every year. Um, even though they say they won't take a single one. We know that whales move around by sonar. Uh, and, and of course, they're sonar blasting to, to site the turbines. So, uh, and then the turbines are going to be built in their migration routes. It's going to disrupt their food supply. It's going to disrupt their migration. Studies have shown in Scotland, in the North Sea, that uh, they are reducing the wind turbines there are, uh, but because of the churning is, is reducing oxygen and thus reducing uh, the uh, food chain. And yet the government claims that not a single whale will be killed or is being killed. It's all other things. Yeah, I can tell you this. Uh, most people don't know this, but I'm significantly hearing impaired. I wear two very small, tiny hearing aids in my ears. And I have been to wind farms uh, down at Tehachapi, for example, and other places. And when I stand there next to these, also uh, on South Point on Hawaii, when I stand there in these wind turbine farms, my ears go wacko because the hearing aids are getting that subsonic and they're turning it into pressure waves. And it's just, I can't stand there. So I can imagine how the whales feel because they deal with that low frequency stuff a lot to communicate. And it's magnified in the water. I mean, the sound is magnified in the water. Yes. Well, they say that I think in Canada, they're talking about how many are, at least our Canadian <laughs> activists are, that they have some sort of um, theory that uh, certain people are impacted more, but those with motion sickness or, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out why cer a certain percentage of the population is harmed by these. And I guess you're bothered by it, Anthony. Uh, I think Sterling and I determined because we went to Kiss Rock concerts back in the 70s and uh, Aerosmith that our eardrums have been blown out. Uh, sufficiently that the wind turbines don't bother us when we're next to them. Yeah, once you've been to uh, third row in front, the, in front of the stacks of Ted Nugent's concert, you never worry about any sound from anything else. You know, What'd you say, Sterling? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well. <laughs> exactly. All right. Do we have any more questions to talk about today? Okay, Richard Voss asks, what is the best realistic alternative to fossil fuels? Nuclear? Well, I would say Yes. Um, and I'm going to talk about that just a bit. We have our nuclear program in the United States and much of the world is predicated on uranium-235 and 238 and so forth and so on. Uh, these fissible materials were also part of the bomb making process, plutonium-238 too. And so the problem is, is that we originally started down a path that had divergence in the way that we might do nuclear power, but because of the bomb, and because we had dedicated all these facilities to refining uranium-235, we ended up with that mostly as a nuclear power program. But there's a better way. There is thorium. Thorium is an, also a radioactive element. It's also extremely abundant in the Earth's crust. And it does not have all the problems associated with uh, you know, the, the fissile materials like U-235, plutonium-238, so forth and so on. It, it doesn't have the, you know, long half-lives and poisonous characteristics. And so it's actually a better pathway to go down for nuclear power. But the United States all but abandoned thorium nuclear power research. Interestingly enough, in 2015, I was at the American Geophysical Union conference where Dr. James Hansen was speaking. And I was in the front row and I was able to ask him a question. And I asked him about nuclear power and specifically thorium. And Dr. James Hansen said, yes, absolutely. That needs to be in the mix of solving our energy in the future. The problem is that only solves the electricity supply. It doesn't solve transportation fuels. It doesn't oh, no, provide but... plastics. It doesn't make steel. Well, well transportation, the, the... we need the flux capacitor. I think that that will be it. <laughs> well, I, d I do want to give two points to that. One, nuclear is great for uh, some of the baseload stuff, um, but it, it doesn't have the ability of, say, natural gas to be ramped up and down very quickly, very easily. You're really not, once you turn on nuclear, you're supposed to leave it on. <laughs> you can't, like, you know, turn it off and turn it on um, with accordance uh, to energy demand. And um, I would also add you, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Additionally, I want to make one correction. Last week, we talked about um, steel manufacturing. 
And a viewer who works in the steel industry reached out to me and pointed out that, you know, while while fossil fuels are very important for steel manufacturing in the United States, about 70% of our manufacturing comes from electric driven um, processes and not from coal anymore. So just wanted to make that quick correction uh, so that we're not misleading our audience or anything on accident or otherwise. Excellent point, Lene. I was going to say, uh, I think we're forgetting also hydro, where it's uh, it's also been proven to be a fairly reliable source. And, but the Greens, of course, are knocking down the dams, as they just did Calamity Basin, they're trying to do. So I think that's proven to be. I honestly, though, uh, as far as the question goes, what's reasonable alternative to fossil fuels, at least at CFAT, we don't see there's a reason to move from fossil fuels entirely, especially natural gas. So uh, part of the question is based on uh, the idea that we need to move. And I would I would ask to think twice about that. There's not a need to move from fossil fuels. It is not. It is not. OK, so I think it's time to wrap up our show. Um, we've answered a lot of questions. We've talked about a lot of topics. We've skewered some actually ridiculous things. Uh, so I think it's time to go. Craig, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, Craig Rucker of CFAC, C-F-A-C-T, con- uh, uh, Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. Is that right? That's right. It's a mouthful. Thanks, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be on the program. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Sterling. And thank you, Linnea, for being with us. And thank you to our viewers for uh, suffering through all of our talkativeness. I want to say thanks and have a great weekend. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate, wishing you a great day and a great weekend. Bye-bye. He's a lion, dog-faced pony soldier.